demonstrating and showing your own concern for the family and, uh, and your own care for, for health. We share a loss today. Each one of us is also celebrating a life, a life well lived of a sister and a mother, grandmother and a dear friend uh, for so many of us. Uh, death is part of the circle of life, but we do not grieve as those without hope. I want to read just a piece from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as indeed the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and also rose from the dead, so that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have already fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. There's comfort in a moment like this because there's a resurrection. And this is, uh, this is good news that we share on a, on a day of bad news. And so we, we want to hold on to that hope. There's comfort in knowing that there is a resurrection. There's a place called heaven that our God uh, is in our presence here. Times like this remind us that we too live a mortal life, that our, uh, our time is coming as well. And we live in preparation uh, for, for eternity and we're called to prepare for that. So may the Lord our God bring comfort to all of you who are here today, and may he also use this as a milestone in our own journey of life and prepare us for our own um, eternity. So I, uh, let's, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for uh, Helen Sawatsky. Uh, we're here today because she's significant in our own story. Uh, she's touched each one of us in, in so many different ways. And, uh, and if we would just open up for stories, it would go on all day as we would share uh, the things that you've taught us through this person uh, named Helen Swatsky. So thank you, Lord, for, uh, for her life and for bringing us together in this place. I pray, Lord, as we bid our farewells uh, and our, our see you laters, that we will be reminded, Lord, of eternity, that we will be reminded of a life well lived, that we will be called in our own selves to consider how we're living our lives as well. So guide us, Lord, through, through our time together here. Bring us the comfort that we need and bring us the grace and the direction that we need as we look forward. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So for the service today, um, we're going to have, uh, the family's going to be sharing in a number of different ways. So uh, Dwayne's going to come and read scripture, and then we'll have a couple of congregation songs uh, led by a, a grandson-in-law uh, and, and family. And then uh, the obituary and the eulogy, again, by, by family, they'll introduce themselves as they come up, all right? So, Dwayne. Hello, my name is Dwayne Gertzen, uh, married to Hans and Helen's daughter, Sylvia, and uh, it's been my privilege to be part of the family um, mom, uh, mom had a side of humor that I think most of us know, and uh, uh, sometimes I'd like to bug her, and uh, I, I think she liked that too. I, w I wasn't always sure if she did, but uh, um, I joked with, with our girls the uh, last time we saw her in the hospital, and uh, we hugged her, and and she said, I love you, sweetheart. And uh, I, I bugged my girls that that was for me, but uh, they said it was for them. Um, both of us can, can think that, I guess. Uh, there's a passage I'd like to read here that is um, very applicable. Uh, often in this world, we live by the things that we see, but we know that that's not the whole truth. There's a side of faith that we don't see. And uh, we need to remember that that is truth. And this passage talks about that. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this. 
Now we know that the earthly tent we live in, that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. I think Dave's going to expand on some of these verses later as he speaks, but uh, yeah, thank you. So my name is Joseph Duick. I haven't been in the family for very long, but I married to Isabel Gertzen, now Duick, um, two years ago. And so I got to call Grandma, Grandma for a few years, and she was a lovely person to be with. And this is Phoebe Lawrenson. She's a cousin to the Gertzen family. And we're going to sing a few songs with you, and you guys are welcome to stand if you like. And if you're not able to sing, that is okay. But know that God is still a great God, worthy of worship, even though our hearts are breaking. He is a God of comfort, so we're going to sing to him now.
guys can have a seat. Uh, my name is Isabel Duick. I am Helen's oldest granddaughter. Um, and I'll be reading the obituary. On Thursday, March 9th, 2023, Helen Swatsky of Winnipeg passed away peacefully with family by her side. She spent 66 beautiful years on this earth and her brief, brief yet courageous battle with cancer has left a Helen-sized hole in all family and friends who will cherish and celebrate the memory of her life. Helen was born on November 7, 1956 to Aaron and Katharina Giesbrecht of Colony Menno Chaco, a small farming community of Lichtenau, Paraguay. Helen was the sixth of nine children in the Giesbrecht family. Her memories of roasting harvested peanuts, drinking warm, fresh milk, and adventurous play with her siblings were greater than those of the challenges they endured, considering half of the family was nearly blind. Faith was an integral part of their home, and school took place in the church where her father was an elder. Perhaps the only disdain she held towards her childhood was the utter repulsion towards all things slithering, crawling, or croaking. In her 13th year, on June 15, 1969, her family arrived in Manitoba, Canada, settling first in Niverville before moving to Winnipeg in the summer of 1972. Though Helen enjoyed school and completed the ninth grade at Elmwood High School, the home culture acquired teens capable of work to help support the large family. True to her generous nature, she looked out well for her younger sisters and often brought them treats from her small allowance. She was first employed at Concordia Hospital, the Salaberry location, in kitchen and laundry, but the younger Helen was not comfortable with the realities of patient care and went to work for Chemcrest until she moved to Alberta in the late 1970s. Shortly before the move to Alberta, a relationship began with Hans Sawatsky of Niverville, a friend of her brothers from those early years in Canada. Their life together was a new province away from most of their families when they were married on September 5, 1980. Their first daughter, Sylvia, had come along and their second daughter, Laura, arrived two years later. With the 1980s economic crash, their return to Manitoba was imminent. Laura was just five days old when they departed for a fresh start in Winnipeg. After several moves within the city, their third daughter Miranda was born. They settled in Valley Gardens area, close to schools and amenities for their girls within walking and biking distance. Helen was baptized in 1984 and became a member at Aaron Street Mission Chapel. The trajectory of her children's upbringing was being set with her steadfast life, faith in Christ, and commitment to the body of believers. This remained an intrinsic part of her that stayed all her days. She valued being a homemaker, which gave many opportunities to be the neighborhood mom, or Tante, Ellen, Tante Helen, to the many children she babysat. This title stuck with her church family and the friends of her girls. For years, Helen ministered through various ways, including a musical quartet called the Sunshine Group uh, as Awana Cubby's director, kitchen co coordinator, Sunday school teacher, church librarian, and many summers in the camp kitchen at Roseau River Bible Camp. Helen was happiest spending time with family and friends, especially so when any granddaughters were present. Her home had a revolving door and a bottomless pot of coffee taking in a bomber game on TV, shopping for others, filling our tummies, and exchanging laughter amused her. To us all, she is an incredible example of unconditional love, generosity, selflessness, simplistic living, and resiliency. Helen's life was full of blessing and burden, but she was never one given to complaining. If anything, those, these difficulties drove her closer to her savior, her friend, her confidence, her hope. Even in the face of devastating family losses and an incurable diagnosis a few short months ago, she resolutely set her, set her mind's eye to Zion. How fitting that heaven's brilliance is the first thing she's ever clearly seen. Helen will be held in the heart of her husband of 42 years, Hans. 
in the hearts of her three daughters, Sylvia and Duane Gertson, Laura and Ryan Elaine, and Miranda Sawatsky. Her granddaughters, Isabel and Joseph Duick, Peyton, Willow, and Ember Gertson, and Nora and Tristan Elaine. In addition, her siblings, Eva and Peter Kaler, Abe and Lisa Giesbrecht, Ed and Helen Giesbrecht, Leah and David Gallup, and Vera and Larry Bergen, along with their families. She was predeceased by two granddaughters, Sophie and Acacia Gertson, her parents Aaron and Katharina Giesbrecht, and brother Joel in infancy, as well as brothers John and Jake. A private family interment will take place in the Rosa River Community Cemetery at a later date. The family is grateful for your prayers, and every visit or phone call to mom, whether in the hospital or well at home, along with the deep appreciation for the warm, attentive staff in the GD6 ward at HSC. In lieu of flowers, donations may be made to Helen's memory, to, in Helen's memory, to Cancer Care Manitoba. Gordon and I am almost eight. My grandma was one of a kind. She never complained even when she was holding. But now where she is, she is not holding. Grandma took us for a bus ride, which she did often just because she knew we liked it. it she let me and Nora hang from the falls up on top of the bus seats. It was fun. She was fun like that. I would like to be like her. When we had sleepovers, we would normally sleep in Grandma's room on the floor. She let us read books, too. Sometimes Grandma told me and Nora to be quiet because we talked too much. <laughs> Grandma made me feel comforted because that's how she always was. She wrote me letters. The last day I saw her in the hospital, she said, bye, sweetheart, and it made me feel comforted. It, I would, I will always love her and miss her, I'm sure all of us will. Hi, my name is Willow Gertson, and I am 12 years old. I'm the fourth granddaughter of Helen Swatsky. Grandma, you are so loving, funny, kind, understanding, and patient. I love you so much, and there are no words to say how much I miss you, and I'm going to keep missing you. Grandma said this to me. Keep trusting Jesus. He sticks closer than a brother, and he will help you make right decisions in life. It has been one week since you went to heaven, where it is so much better for you, and where there is no pain or tears, and where she is with her Savior. I remember when us granddaughters would go with her on the bus rides to Dollarama, and she would say every time that we could get three things, it would take hours, and she would still, no, and then she would still be there, not saying we had to go. That was her all the time, so patient with us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow and death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and staff they comfort me. Psalms 23, verse 4. And I will not say goodbye to you, because like Grandpa said, it is not goodbye, but really, see you soon. In Grandma's words, I am proud of all you granddaughters for growing up. You are all most beautiful, gentle, and kind. Keep it up. See you soon, sweetheart. We will never stop loving you, Grandma, for we know that if the tent, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building for God, a house, not made with hands eternal and made with the hands eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Hello, I am Peyton. I am 15 and a middle granddaughter. If I had to pick two thoughts to describe Grandma, it would be that she loved us lavishly and was a selfless person. Even when she was having a hard day, she would be thinking of everyone but herself. You would never hear her complain. I have several memories with Grandma. 
some of which were bus rides to Giant Tiger, the swimming pool, the library, and Dollarama. Whether it was games of face 10 or, getting, or eating Mr. Noodle on the deck, it was always a cheery time with Grandma around. When she first went to the hospital, I wrote her a letter, and she wrote me back. This is some of what she wrote. Dear Peyton, thank you for the letter you sent me. I love you, and you are so very special to me. Keep trusting Jesus to help you make right decisions in your life. He will never lead you wrong. This just really stuck out to me, and it makes me think that really God is the most important thing in my life, as he was in her life. Grandma, I wish we could be in heaven with you now, celebrating and praising Jesus. Thank you for the amazing example you have set for us. Thank you for always being patient with me. You were such a blessing to me. I love you, and I will miss you so, so much. Life is difficult, but God helps make it less so. He guides me when I don't know what to do and lifts me up when I get down. And I'll leave this verse with you. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will fly up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be tired. They will walk and not be weary. I'm Miranda Swatsky, Helen's baby. Uh, just some fun facts about mom. She was legally blind, um, but she worked as a quality inspector. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she drove once uh, in reverse, then panicked and left the vehicle there for one of her brothers to go get. Um, she forgot my birthday one year, but that's when Isabel was born, the day before my birthday. So, new grandma, that's acceptable. Um, she never met a Smokey she didn't like. Um, she always slept with her window open, even in minus 40. She was a morning person, like from the minute she woke up. She could carry a conversation, and all you wanted to do was read the cereal box. Um, for someone who didn't drive, she always knew what was wrong with your car, though. Um, not always right, but it was fun to hear. Uh, queen of the snacks. The girls always, um, they would literally tell Sylvan Laura, like, I'm not asking you, mommy, I'm asking grandma. Um, to this day, she still couldn't get her name straight. It was always like, oh, Sylvia, Laura, Miranda, Vera. <laughs> Um, Vaseline and chapstick in every single pocket. Uh, she pushed Laura into traffic in a shopping cart. Uh, there wasn't much traffic and Laura was a teenager. <laughs> uh, she was a tambourine player in the Sunshine Group. Um, she taste tested every crumb that may have brushed on her hand from the table. She taught us about sharing, especially when something smelled really bad, and it was like, oh, oh, that's bad. Here you should smell, too. <laughs> she was the neighborhood before and after school care, um, plus lunches. Uh, at one point, she had 17 kids she made lunches for. And well, well, I have absolutely no doubt that she was so proud of us. Once she became grandma, like that was a whole new, whole new level of love and pride. She loved you girls so much. So mom. I know you wouldn't want us to be sad. You're celebrating. You're in heaven with Sophie and Acacia. You're pain free. You're able to run. I mean, like, you probably wouldn't, because why? <laughs> but I'm still going to need a minute to not be sad. I will forever remember your beauty, both inside and out. Your heart, which was so big, you were always so giving, so kind. You always thought of others first. 
your brain, the way you process things. It was never poor me. Instead, you looked for the silver lining in everything. <laughs> your beautiful gray eyes. The way they would sparkle when you were just truly happy. And your hands, the same hands that disciplined me as a child. Those same hands that sewed so many outfits, made so many delicious meals, wiped away so many tears. Oh, and your arms that were so strong. You carried so much. But they held, you, held me so tenderly when all I needed was a mom hug. If you've hugged my mom, you knew. She was the best hugger. <sighs> mom, I am so lucky to have had you as my mom. You encouraged me. You supported me like no other. Literally, I moved back home four times. <laughs> you loved me so hard, even as a teenager, when I'm sure that was difficult. You never let anything slow you down. You overcame the obstacles set in your way. And you came out even stronger on the other side. All I can say is thank you. Thank you for your patience and your kindness. Thank you for loving me so hard. I love you. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm Helen's middle daughter. As I sit down to write this, I'm unsure. I'm unsure to how to put into words how much my mom meant. I'm unsure to ha how to say goodbye to the one who grew me and named me and loved me. I'm unsure of what a future looks like without my mom. She was one of the strongest women that I know. First and foremost, she was strong in her faith. She was strong morally. She was strong in her love for everyone that she knew and everyone she met. Uh, that's a strength we're going to need to draw on, I think, over the next days, years to come. She had a gravitational pull to, to her. She was everybody's best friend, aunt, second mom, or second grandma to so many people. I'm sure we weren't well off as kids, but none of us felt that. My mom kept us fed and clothed and cared for. She was our biggest supporter and defender in life. And we knew how loved we were. We were, really, we were happy. That love continued to show through her eight granddaughters. Um, and as everybody knows, we're a very, very female, uh, heavy family. Um, but she then, that love continued on to her boys, uh, Dwayne and Ryan and Joe. She always called them her boys that somebody else raised. Uh, throughout mom's battle with leukemia, she stayed positive. Even on the days, and she, I'm sure she wasn't feeling it. And I know she did that to help us, to protect us, and to help carry us through. And that was just her nature, which I'm sure one of you has crossed paths with her. You can attest to that. She was truly your mom until her last breath. Um, Thanksgiving Sunday this past October, it was a beautiful day. We had a beautiful family lunch all together. Um, the weather was amazing. We sat outside, we had a bonfire, the kids were running around. Uh, mom was having some sciatic issues, or that's what we had thought. Um, little did we know that two days later, she would embark on her final struggle here on earth. I look back at that day and I'm still so very thankful that none of us knew what the future held. Uh, we were just truly able to enjoy being together. Uh, Mom was fun-loving. She craved time with her family and friends, and she was always up for anything. She opened her home to anyone, anytime. She had a great sense of humor. Her and I would often walk to Superstore and just read greeting cards for hours for the fun of it. Uh, kind of sideways looks from other shoppers, but we could pick out who this card would be perfect for. There's so many for Uncle Larry, because, you know, you're so easy to <laughs> pick on. <laughs> um... She loved a good prank, so long as she wasn't the victim. Um, this is especially true during her years at camp in the kitchen. Uh, the staff knew they could always look to her to sneak them whatever we needed for those said pranks. Um, often the staff would come back um, during our short 24-hour period in between camps. They would come back to our place, and we'd all crash there. There must have been 25 of us sleeping on every surface of her house. Uh, but she had blankets, pillows for everybody, and she truly enjoyed, enjoyed having us all there. One of these weekends, we had all gone to a movie, or maybe roller skating, and we came back about one in the morning, and there was a cap gun on the fridge, 
And one of the guys set it off in the middle of the night. Now, of course, all of us collapsed on the floor laughing because we don't want to wake up mom, right? And we thought we had pulled it off. Um, so the next morning in church, mid-sermon, mom, um, careful to hide it from whoever was speaking that morning, turned around with the cap gun and pointed it all at us in the middle of the ch middle of a church sermon. And that's just my mom. She had that side to her. And so obviously we woke her up and she knew. Um, my mom, she was... She was ready and she was relieved when she made her a decision to go into comfort care last week. And she knew her struggle was almost over. She said her biggest sadness was going to be not being able to see the grandkids grow up. Um, but the pull towards heaven and knowing that she'd be with Sophie and Keisha was such a great comfort and such a draw for her too. I really miss her beyond measure. We called each other just so, so often just to say hi and check in. She didn't know how to send memes, so usually she would just call me to repeat some funny meme she read. Um, Ryan just said earlier this week, like, I'm just gonna miss that constant casual, hi mom, hi mom, because like, we just call each other so often. And I sat down with Nora this week and I said, you know, grandma doesn't have cancer anymore, right? She can see perfectly. I said, you know how she has trouble walking? Well, grandma can run now. And she's probably chasing after Sophie and Acacia. And Nora's little face just lit up with such a big smile at that thought. Um, the tears will still come for a long time, I'm sure. There's such a big void in all of our hearts, and life feels untethered right now. But I know my mom, and she would want us, she'd want to see that big smile on all of our faces. Um, so then, that's what we'll do one day at a time, keep moving forward together. I told her in, early last week, don't worry about us, we'll be okay, we have each other. It doesn't feel that way right now, perhaps, um, but we'll get there. We've seen the support from all of you this past week, and we really appreciate each and every one of you and the role you had in Mom's life. We're thankful for each one of you who has helped us today. It's definitely a testament to Mom's impact in the world. Hi there, I'm Sylvia. Uh, the firstborn, so probably the more serious one. Uh, I'll let them take care of the fun stuff, and they were serious too. Um, Dad would love to share something today, but it's just hard. And so it feels hard to gather your emotions at such a time, and so he took a pass on that. But he just loved Mom dearly, and this is going to be very hard. Uh, thank you all for coming today, for those that came last night too. Uh, thanks for reaching out and being a friend to us or to my parents, especially in the last year and the, the last couple months, whether a text or a phone call or a personal visit. Uh, they greatly appreciate it and we greatly appreciate it just to know people were checking in on them. There are so many stories and accolades of mom that we will be telling at, for the rest of our days and we'd be privileged to share them with you if time permitted. And we'd certainly enjoy hearing your memories too. They're just, it's those sweet treasures that we just tuck away now. Though mom wasn't drawn, sorry, though mom was drawn to all things bedazzling, bright, and bold, her character wasn't flashy or noisy, even if some of those slideshow pictures you saw earlier beg to differ. She made friends of people of all ages and all walks of life. And honestly, I think some of my friends we're just as much her friends. <laughs> Mom taught us girls the value of a dollar and putting in hard work. And yes, even city girls can learn those things. Uh, that's, we started out before Miranda could, was barely walking on her own, much too young to be much of a help to us. But Mom's method was a flyer route. It had 700 homes on it. We did this twice a week for at least 10 years. We did this rain or shine, and Mom always was the instigator. We just had to do this, get it done, and it will be done. This job paid us by the flyer, by the penny, or the half penny, and then we split it four ways, and Mom just always took an even cut, even though she probably did over half the work. We learned persistence, the art of not complaining, and working efficiently as a team. Another time when I was already engaged to Duane and looking to make an extra dollar for some, I decided to deliver the Winnipeg Free Press. So before I left for my full-time job in the 
for the day, Mom willingly got up with me at five in the morning, in the dark, even though she had to carry a flashlight to help me find the house numbers, because that's just what we did and that's who she was. But by then we were a little wiser and we both quit after a month. <laughs> she also sewed many of our summer clothes that Miranda mentioned. It was always a patterned print, a matching top and shorts. Our children can thank us that we never acquired that skill. <laughs> what we did catch for her th from her though was an eye for a deal and the uh, inability to pass it by. One time she had us each buy two boxes of sunlight laundry detergent and it was whatever, the limit of eight or ten. But to get them home we had to balance these on our bike handles. So we balanced this swaying poundage from our handlebars and hoped that the handles wouldn't rip or that it would lead to a, some disastrous wipeout. I think we made it home that time. Uh, I won't go into details about the pails of ice cream. <laughs> so we learned how to give things away, to save, and to return an unnecessary purchase. More significant, though, was that I routinely witnessed Mum reading her Bible by the time I came to the kitchen on any given school morning, she was already sitting there. She had eaten her breakfast of buttered toast, probably on cup two or three of coffee, and was feeding her soul in the word. She was teaching me how she esteemed and depended on the Lord, something that I didn't entirely perceive until I was much older. Even until her last trip in the hospital, Mom's Bible always sat on the table. So if we wanted to eat a meal, her Bible got cleared off at every meal. If we wanted to play a game, we cleared her Bible off the table. It was just there where it belonged, ready to nourish her at any time of day. I see now how my younger mom was still growing up into the woman that we know her today. As a child, I couldn't understand the grace that moms need. Believe it or not, my mom could be impatient or bossy. She could lose her temper and nag. She could be too strict at times and too lenient at other times. There were seasons where I know my mom was struggling to hope, to care about anything, and she wrestled with God on a lot of things. Yet every time she landed on the truth, he is God, I am not, so I just have to trust him time and time again. She wasn't perfect, but she longed to be a reflection of Jesus. She was the best mom for me, but she was an even better grandma. She treasured each granddaughter and lit up in their presence. She savored their scribbles. Her fridge and her bedroom walls are still lined with their artwork to this day. Any messes they left behind, and there was a lot, and there still was a lot of crumbs. <laughs> They never stressed her out. It spoke to her of them having a good snack, a good meal, and a good time. She became their encourager through cards, the gift of time, experiences, handwritten letters, hugs. Uh, she even purchased painted cow bones from Acacia's personal store just to support her. And she was just getting the hang of replying to their emails. These girls were her earthly rewards for her own years of child rearing. My recent, more meaningful times with mom took place within the last 19 months as our family began this all too familiar walk through the valley. She dependably spoke Sophie and, of Sophie and Acacia and cried with me just as much every time. Together, we yearned for heaven, homesick for our homecoming, hopeful that we would not be here much longer. And her prayers were being answered, and she was at peace with the journey that was before her. These last days with Mum, watching her cross over from life to death and life again were difficult, but so sacred. She was inching closer to her forever home. Our love and memories can't replace the physical presence of someone we love. Rather, they are a temporary solution to an internal problem that only God can resolve. 
Though our hearts feel like Swiss G's, we can't fill them or plug them or distract them. The brokenness of life tears away pieces of my heart, and God just mends it over and over and over. His fullness is my wholeness. So until we meet again, Mom, I will always love you and hold the tension of living fully here and longing for the words, Oh, Mom, oh, Sylvia, you're here too.
You're all welcome to stand again if you like. We have one more song to sing. And it is a beautiful promise that God will hold us fast. And as Grandma, as Helen, as however you know, Helen Sawatsky is now in heaven. We have one more person to look forward to seeing there besides Jesus, who we long to wait, we long to see, and we wait for the day for when we all get to heaven. So we're going to sing about that one day, about our glorious future with Christ for those of you who believe in him. And I'm so thankful that we can look forward to a resurrection day. And let's sing together expectantly for that day.
that was a good concert. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe, and, and to the family. It was beautiful. Um, it, it's always a blessing at a funeral to hear about, to hear from the family, to hear who is this person, and to re reflect, is this the same person that we knew, right? Is, uh, are we at the right funeral? And hell, this... <laughs> This is, the, this is the Helen that we knew, and I would, uh, so we moved here, we got to know Helen back in the late 1900s when we moved to Winnipeg uh, to pastor the church for 10 years, and uh, this, uh, Helen's grace uh, was just core. So when I mentioned to our family or to our children that Helen Swatsky had passed away, uh, was, there were some texts fly back and forth, and one of them was, um, Helen Swatsky was foundational for us as a family when we moved to, to Winnipeg with our five children, the te three teenage girls, and them trying to find their way, and Helen kind of served as a local grandmother uh, for our girls, for our children at that time, and ma massively significant. Uh, she exercised grace in relationship, and, and this is something that was significant to me. Uh, you know, there's the experts that are supposed to be able to answer all the questions, and Helen would be the person that, that you know, in the confusion and when, when chaos and relationship challenges are happening, then she'd say, uh, just come here, I'll come here for a bit, I'll give you a hug until the other people figure it all out. And in the meantime, and so she would just hold you uh, and take care of the need of the moment until the solutions were found. And then, and then you'd find out that you'd actually found the solution because in the meantime, she answered some of your questions. And that's just the kind of character that she was. Always, always that extra grace in tough circumstances. Um, she was blind and we uh, heard that a few times. Uh, but she saw things by faith that so many of us would always miss. And she'd always see by faith. She, so she lived through some very hard times. Uh, she chose always to see the positive part. We saw, we heard that as well. She chose to see hope, and that hope is in Christ, uh, in Christ Jesus, and she held to that consistently. And even, even when uh, her own sickness uh, came and her own uh, death draw near, it's okay because Christ waits for us on the other side, and I know that. And, uh, and it, was, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't lost on her that this is also a reunion with Sophie and Keisha. She's, she's aware of that and with the rest of her family down the road. She hold out for this because this doesn't end here. Life is hard, but it doesn't end here. We walk by faith, not by sight, Second Corinthians. We heard that a couple times uh, today already. Uh, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, this is good, uh, but to die is gain. Then I get to be with Jesus. Better by far, I didn't even know which, which one to choose. Uh, because it's better by far to be with Christ, but, but here we are in this world. So I, I, I want to be quick about this, but I, I do want to read a scripture. Um, Helen, I remember one time we were uh, running Awana, and so she was running cubbies in the, in the nursery, and I'm, I was in, the, in my office, and a lot of you know the calls back buildings. I'm in my office running a Bible study with some of the parents, and all of a sudden there's some crash bang going on in the nursery, and somebody just made a comment like, uh, what's with the... Uh, Cubby leader, is she blind, doesn't know what's going on there? <laughs> I, I wasn't wanting to be careful how I responded to that, but my own son was in that group, and so, so I said, uh, uh, sh they're in very good hands. She's being watched by the best. <laughs> she can't see anything, but she's watching them, and everything will be good. Um, but because she saw by faith, and she had that grace, and you always knew you are safe, at least for the moment, until better things came around. That was Helen. So uh, there's a story of a uh, blind man in John chapter 9. It's a long chapter, so I'm just going to read the introduction, the punchline, and the conclusion, okay? Uh, so we'll be quick about this. Uh, as Jesus, John chapter 9, Jesus passed by, saw a man who had been blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man was sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in the blind man. Uh, so we must carry out the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world, Jesus said. And when he had said this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, applied the mud to his eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so he went, he left and he washed and he came back seeing. So Christ is the power of healing. And so he, uh, he, he's a power, and he, he heals the blind man, makes the mud, puts it on his eyes, says, go off to the pool of Siloam and wash. He leaves, he goes to the pool of Siloam and he washes, and he comes back and he's seeing, but Jesus is not there. He never saw Jesus. 
Then begins the debate. So there's a debate already before this starts. Why is he blind? Who, whose fault is it? Who did it? Uh, what's going on? That's where the conversation starts. Once he's healed, the conversation and the debate goes, goes crazy. Because everybody, well, who, who did it? How did he do it? Is it fair? Uh, is that allowed? Uh, the religious leaders in particular we don't, can't explain it. What happened? And how do we explain it? If we can't explain it, we're not in control. And this is, this is awkward. And this is messy. So we don't know what to do with the blind man who can see, because that's weird. And we don't know what to do with the Jesus who healed him, because that's even weirder. And so there's this sense of loss. Where do we go from here? Uh, Ultimately, as the debate goes back and forth and they haul the family into the debate, try to get answers and all this, but they just, the, the religious leaders in particular just do not like Jesus. Ultimately, ultimately um, they come back to the man and they, for the second time they came back to the man who was, had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God, we know that Jesus is a sinner. Then he answered, and the, the man, the blind man who was seeing answered this way. He said, uh, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. The one thing I do know, that I was blind, and now I see. That I know. And you explain it. You explain it. Well, you're asking me for explanation. I don't know. All I know is I was blind, now I see. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> I think that's uh, how Helen would have said it. <laughs> um, I was blind, but now I see. The d they didn't like that. They didn't like that response because they, they want explanation. And now all of a sudden he's got the upper hand. Now he's also asking the question, oh, why do you keep asking about Jesus? You want to be his disciple too? And at this, uh, to, up to that point, this man didn't, didn't even know. All he knows is he could see. And all of a sudden he's finding himself, I kind of like this Jesus. He let me see. But they don't like it. And so they, they um, struggle with what to do. They've lost control. So the solution is kick him out. And they did that in verse 34 of this chapter. Uh, they put him out. And this man, so here's a man who's been blind, now he can see, and now his circumstance is actually worse than it was before. Before, he actually at least knew he could go to the temple, and he could beg there, and he would get food for the day. He knew that much. Now all of a sudden, he's not even allowed back to the temple because you're, you're out of here. Now he doesn't have friends, he doesn't have connections. Everything that he, that all, the little that he did have has been taken from him, and he's lost. And so here, before he had this blindness problem, um, and they debated about that, now he's got this homelessness problem, and now they're debate, debating about that. But this man's lost, and what's, what strikes me, and this is the, 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 the significant thing in the story to me, is that after they put him out, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had put him out. And, and Jesus went and found him. So G Jesus met him, he was blind, and healed him. Now he's homeless. Now he's lost. And Jesus went and found him. I, saw, I, was, I don't know if Jesus feeling sense of responsibility. I gave him sight, now he's homeless, and I'm going to go help him again? Or, or is, is that just his grace, just his, uh, his, uh, his love for this man? Jesus heard that they had put him out. Jesus went and found him, and he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered by saying, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Just, just tell me, the man's looking for something to believe in. He's looking for something to believe in. And Jesus said, you have both seen him, and he is the one now talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Uh, I imagine that hug. Just come here for a moment, and I'll give you this hug. Here, here is the grace that you need for the moment. And the family today, you need the grace again. Uh, you need this grace. You need to hold on to, to Christ. Christ is the, the one with the power to take us through that valley of the shadow of death and on to glory. Uh, he's the one we want to be holding on to. And here's the good news, is he's not, um, he's not hiding somewhere in the corner wondering where you are and allowing you to come if you want to. Uh, Jesus is coming looking for you. He's coming looking for you, and he's inviting you to himself, and he's offering and willing to walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death that you're in right now. And God will walk with us, and he has the power to carry us uh, to, to glory, uh, to the place uh, that we've been hoping for uh, all along. Um, Jesus will care for you in your deepest need. I find it interesting that Jesus took care of the, the, current, the, the, the current problem of blindness, the physical blindness, but Jesus took care of the real problem of the lostness 
of his heart. He, Jesus came looking for him, found him, and gave him that grace. And Jesus will care for you in your deepest need. And maybe Jesus is out looking for you right now. I know that uh, Helen, is, uh, as we would talk to her and as we would talk to uh, the things that were important to her, um, that her family would meet her in glory. It's important that Sophie and Acacia have gone on ahead of us. That's important to her. And it's important to her that the rest of the family comes and joins her there as well. And, and it's in Christ that we get there. So the, the invitation would be to come to Jesus. Um, confess that you need him because you can't get yourself there. Uh, when, and maybe you're feeling a need for that grace. You're feeling a need for that hug, and Christ is coming looking for you. Uh, confess that you need him because you can't get yourself to heaven. Uh, submit yourself to Jesus because he can get you there. Submit yourself to him and commit your, yourself to follow him because he is the way. He is, the, he, he is our direction for us through this life and all the way to glory. So this is just our uh, encouragement to you. Christ came looking for the blind man. He's looking for you, and he's the one that take us to glory, and this is good news, and we want to close with that. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, I thank you for, again, for the life of Helen Sawatsky. She has been a blessing to us again and again and uh, over and over in so many different ways. And it's not that Helen didn't have challenges and struggles and battles of her own, but she was able to see, uh, not by sight but by faith, to see the things that really matter in life. And we've known her that way. So I, I pray, dear God, for your, uh, your grace on all of us as we struggle. Thank you for taking her home. Uh, for the, the peace that she enjoys, that you've uh, removed the, the suffering, uh, Lord, and that you've given her grace. Thank you for that. And Lord, now we suffer uh, with this loss and with loneliness in different times. Think of Hans and the, the loneliness that he'll, he'll experience, the girls. Uh, life's just going to be different from here moving forward. And so I pray for your grace on each one of them. Walk with us, Lord. Help us to know your presence. Thank you, dear God, for your invitation that when we are at a funeral like this, that we don't stop here in despair. We don't grieve as those who have no hope because Jesus died and he rose again and he uh, has given us grace into eternity. And I thank you for the hope that we have because of your resurrection, God. You're the firstborn from the dead and we're following. And I thank you for that. So dear God, walk with us. Give us your grace and, um, and, and help us to hold out in faith and hope and find joy in the life that we live because of the hope that we have in the resurrection of Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a couple of announcements as we wrap up here. Uh, there, there will be a private family interment uh, to take place at the Rosal River Community Cemetery at a later date. So that's, the date has not been determined, but it's not today. So just, just so you know that. There will be a FOSPA happening in the dining area in a few minutes, and I understand we go with that door around to that side. Um, and apparently there's some food there. I heard something about raisin buns. No? No? Okay, dainties, all right. Uh, close. And coffee. Helen would want there to be coffee. So anyways, FOSPA will happen in the dining area in a few minutes. The family will exit uh, following the casket, and we'll give them a few minutes uh, for their final farewell before we go to eat. So we're just asking that you remain in your seats here. The family will go out. We'll wait in here until the ushers come and uh, dismiss us, all right? So, uh, so let's, uh, we're going to pray for the, for the FOSPA. I'll read the benediction, and then we'll, we'll uh, dismiss the family. Dear God, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for our opportunity to be together in this place. And I pray for grace. Even as we go to FOSPA now, I pray that we will find encouragement and strength together. Sometimes we just don't get together, and we need to, and here's our opportunity. And I pray that we will find grace together, that we will encourage one another, and that you will strengthen us with the food that we do eat together. And I pray again for the family. Dear God, give them grace in this journey, in this loss. Walk with them and give them your peace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll ask the funeral directors to come forward. Um, I'll just read the benediction. And then again, again, just for a uh, reminder, the family will go out, we'll wait in here until the ushers dismiss us, all right? So the Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you, uh, and be gracious toward you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.